While our minds are focused on programming, it's our fingers, our muscle memories, that are getting slowly marinated in the tools that we use. I mean, think about your editor. It's there, just at the edge of your consciousness, for 40 hours a week, for years on end. It's inevitably going to seep right into your bones. Now, I think that's why, as programmers, we get so attached to our editors. They don't just have pros and cons as pieces of software. They can actually feel right or wrong. And so this week, I'm not going to tell you which editor to use any more than I tell you how to feel. But I am going to raise the big question. How do you make such an important tool feel good? My guest this week, TJ DeVries, I think would answer that it comes through the ability to mold and shape, to gradually personalize our tools until they fit us perfectly. And the way that he does that is with NeoVim. It's a fork of Vim which, even if you don't use it, you have to be impressed by it. I mean, how many times in this industry have you seen a 30-year-old code base get a new lease of life? It doesn't happen. And yet they've done it, successfully. I think banks, airlines, governments would give their right arm for the secret to revitalizing three-decade-old software. So this week, we're going to talk about NeoVim, both as a major software project and as a personal developer experience. And as we talk through it, TJ makes a really interesting point that I think I'm going to highlight here before we get stuck in. For many of us, the editor is the first tool where you'll tweak and refine and become both the user and the developer in a perfect feedback loop. So you can see your editor as a kind of free training ground for developer-centric design. It might be your first experience of being a product manager, and it starts with eating your own dog food as you are the user of the thing you want to refine. All from the humble editor that you just can't quit. Let's get stuck in and learning. I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Developer Voices, and today's voice is TJ DeVries. Joining me fresh from the text editor minds, TJ DeVries. TJ, how do you doing? I'm doing great. Happy to be here and uh, chatting about NeoVim and wherever else this conversation takes us. So <laughs> there's only one way to, to find it. out, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I thought we'd start, of all the technical things we need to get into, I thought we'd start a bit with the personal angle because there are so many different projects you could be devoting your time to. Why an editor? Yeah, I think... Part of it is I sort of stumbled into doing this as I was like a very, you know, young software developer. I was at my first uh, like software internship and uh, a coworker of mine used Vim and I was like, he was one of my favorite coworkers to work with, super nice <laughs> and kind and really like helpful. And I just saw the cool stuff he was doing. So I sort of got interested in the editor spray space more broadly, you know, like up until then I had like seen Eclipse. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, that doesn't seem like my favorite thing to contribute, although some people like it, that's fine. You know, um, but at that time, NeoVim was just starting to come out and I found out about this capability that NeoVim had, which and still has, which is the ability to write plugins in any language. And all of a sudden I was like, my mind was blown. I, I can write <laughs> code. And then when I'm writing code, it can do stuff for me. You know, like I'm my own customer. I'm I'm my own, you know, person. I can solve all my own problems with this. This is so cool and interesting and got me really, you know, just excited. And so I uh, I was trying it out and I stumbled into a small problem as well that I had where I wanted to be able to center uh, like the file name in my status line. And it wasn't like an option <laughs> okay. that you could do, right? So I was like, oh, I don't know, whatever. And, and sort of my, you know, my naivete propelled me into sending in a pull request and all this stuff, right? Like I barely know Git. I, I messed up the Git history. They had to like cherry pick the PR, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what was going on, but you know, throughout it, um, just really nice people in the project, really willing, especially, um, you know, I'm, I'm very glad looking back at it that I was courteous and I was like, <laughs> uh, valued their time and wrote a lot of tests and documentation and sort of made it a very well-rounded PR, not just like a, 
threw a grenade over the wall. Here's my code, like figure it <laughs> yeah. out. Right. And so we worked through a lot of the ideas together and I learned, you know, so much from, from doing that. Uh, even though I had sometimes very little idea what I was doing at the start <laughs> and that sort of got me very intrigued in the project and really interested in that space. And it's a nice intersection of a lot of the things that I like doing, which I just like working on developer tools. I like being Mm. the customer of what I'm building. Uh, I think it gives me a lot of insight. And it's really fun to not just solve like other people's problems, really solve to fund solve my own problems. I'm like, oh, it worked. It did the thing that I wanted. That's great. Uh, So that's, that's, I think, sort of how I got started in in that whole space and you know related to neovim right with different plugins and and other things like that yeah yeah it's always particularly nice when you're also a user of the thing you're building as a programmer yes. and you, mm-hmm. you end up with so much better quality because you see the problems so much faster yes. right and you actually are very motivated to fix them because they bother you every day <laughs> yeah, yeah before the public finds out i need yes. this sorted yeah. exactly mm-hmm. <laughs> So there's a lot of stuff already in there we need to unpack. And I think I'm going to pick on um, the first one, which was, I know when it was first announced, perhaps I should go back a step. Yeah. I was a Vim user for a long time. And the thing that ejected me out of Vim was the awfulness of Vim script. I'm going to go on record saying I hate that yeah. language. Yeah. And, and the thing I found interesting about NeoVim was this bring your own configuration, bring your own plugin language thing, yep. which seems to have disappeared. So it's still it's still there, and there are still some plugins that take advantage of this um, for sure. So NeoVim has this concept of they're called remote plugins, and instead of the Vim way that had kind of had it before, where you compiled in the feature for a language, right? You would have like Vim with the Python feature or Vim with the Perl feature, right? So if you do like version in Vim, it'll print off all the features. One of the features would be like if it's compiled in with this language, right? And there's been some changes there and some improvements, although I haven't followed that too closely. But NeoVim sort of said, let's rip all of those out. And instead, what we'll do is we'll provide just an RPC and like an API that we promise will will keep the same, right? So you communicate back and forth with NeoVim via message pack, you send messages, okay. NeoVim says, okay, I can handle those messages and I can do things. And so you can take any language you want and and write plugins with that. And there definitely are still some plugins using that quite successfully. What's really nice about that is Lua also has full access to that same API. And so that was a really big sort of like stepping stone for Lua integration with NeoVim was we already had the full API available, right? And it felt really good to be able to, the same tools and tips and tricks you learn how to do it if you're writing a Python plugin, you were able to do those same tricks inside Lua. Um, You know, the nice thing for Lua is it doesn't require any extra installation step or any environment things or, oh, you have to have, you know, like cargo installed on your computer or the exact Python yeah, version, yeah. right? So there is some aspect where I think um, a lot of people thought of said, actually, you know, Lua is good enough for the things that I'm cr- trying to do, right? It's definitely good enough for this and it's fast enough and, and I've got, and, you know, the tooling around it's gotten good enough that I think I can just solve the problem without reaching for something else. You know, another thing is once you start right, reaching yeah. for something else, you tend to start saying, oh, it's not so bad to like include the kitchen sink, right? Uh, I'll just <laughs> add a few dependencies. Oh, I'll yeah. just add one or two. And suddenly you're like, oh, hmm. That's actually, you know, like a lot bigger. It's a lot bigger than we set out to do. It's a lot more, right? And so there's some, I think, yeah. constraining feature that people enjoy about just using the built-in Lua sort of experience um, there. But it's still 100% supported in NeoVim, and there are still plugins that that use it. In fact, recently, I was showing off um, some of those by writing like a random one in OCaml, which has been the language that I've been playing with. And it's like, it works just the same as all the other languages, right? NeoVim doesn't care what the other language is. It's just sending messages back and forth, which is really cool. So does that mean that uh, Lua, which is the blessed language, is Mm -hmm. that using that RPC call mechanism internally? So it uses the same shape, but we don't have to use the RPC. So we basically like during build time, we create 
it's not exactly a shared library, but it's like similar concept to like a shared library that Lua can communicate with NeoVim directly in process. So it's not doing any like it's not doing any transforming it into a message, sending the message. You know, it skips all of that serialization and right. all those kind of things and so runs directly. So logically, it's the there. same, but don't write to don't write to a pipe. Like, right, don't exactly. turn it into bytes. Yep. Yeah, and you get a, a couple sense. things where you get some extra special things in Lua um, where you can like directly pass a callback, right? Because you're not serializing. So you can like have a function reference and it works just fine. You don't have to do any sort of like additional keeping track of, oh, I sent this message later. I want to reply with this. You just like send the function over. So there's um, the, you it, you'd put it in the same spot as you would, you know, if you were sending over RPC, but you get like you get to cheat a little bit compared to that in Lua because we don't have to serialize, right? We can just pass the Lua reference around in the C code and, and everybody's happy. Yeah, that makes sense. It's mostly mm -hmm. honest. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so the, the obvious question there then is of all the languages you could have picked to bless, why Lua? It's a really good question. And people have this question a lot. You know, they kind of wonder, like, why didn't we just put, you know, V8 inside? Or why didn't we put, uh, like, Wasm? Or why not, like, Python? Like, lots of people know Python. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a couple things. One, some of those technologies were very different when NeoVim started. You wouldn't, you know, I don't even remember if Wasm was around. Maybe Wasm was around when NeoVim started. We're but, talking 2016, right? They're probably both uh, experimental projects back then. Yeah, yeah, right. And definitely not like, oh, you can build it on every platform and everyone gets why it would be a good idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So um but like besides all of the, those things, NeoVim in my mind is one of the sort of like perfect use cases for Lua. Lua is a very simple and small language. And the features that it has are things like it, you can build it practically anywhere. It's, you know, just plain. I think like it compiles on C89 or C90. I don't know. So it's like anywhere with a C compiler, you're going to be able to compile Lua and it's going to work. We use the Lua 5.1 uh, version, which is set in stone. There's no like changes, right? So anything that you've ever written in Lua that you knew of from Lua 5.1 always works forever in Neovim. There's no sort of like, oh, well, that's not the way that things are anymore. We added this new special keyword or something, right? There's no, there's none of that. Uh, there's no, there's no changes there. Lua is also super, super easy to embed inside of a C application, which Neovim's written in C. I've heard um, that, yeah. And so what's really powerful, right, is that we can put Lua right side by side with where we would have stored like a Vim script reference or like a Vim script, right? You just like, oh, well, you just make a union and see, you say, oh, we either we've got, you know, this, we've got a Vim script thingy or we've got a string or we've got a Lua reference. If we have the Lua reference, then we use that and execute it in the Lua state. Or, you know, we do the things that we were normally doing before. And then once we're done, we tell Lua, hey, I don't I don't need this reference anymore. And then if no one else is holding on to the reference, Lua's, you know, garbage collects it out and, and all of those goodies, right? So it's really, really easy to put this sort of side by side with a C program and, and sort of like, we didn't have to throw away everything, right? We didn't have to re-architect the whole project or redo all of these other things um, to get Lua running. And then... The, so there's two probably other primary things. The, the, uh, one of them is that Lua has a pretty active, you know, ecosystem in terms of the things going on in the world. People are like writing Lua. It happens in, you know, game mods or inside of like Nginx or other things, right? So there exists people who care about things like, it would be really good if we had a very, very fast JSON parser. And that's like, okay, right, yeah. well, then we just pull that in. You know, we just, we, we can grab Lua C JSON. We can put that inside of NeoVim, all the JSON parsing, serialization, deserialization. Boom, it was like, I don't remember, 30x faster than what we had before that was like inside of Vim that was, you know, hand rolled for some stuff, right? So it's like, okay, right. so we just like boosted everything by 30x, which matters a lot if you're serializing lots of messages with, you know, LSP or things like that. Yeah. Um, and so that's really powerful as you get to pull in the ecosystem uh, for some things. And then the last sort of thing is a lot of people that are using NeoVim by default, instead of having just a Lua 5.1 sort of Lua 5.1, actually the regular thing, we're actually shipping Lua JIT, which is a JIT sort of like compiler, interpreter, whatever you want to say, 
jits are i guess you know i don't <laughs> some people are very particular about the words for that i guess but okay <laughs> lua jit is like an incredibly incredibly fast like runtime for lua that's abi compatible with lua 5.1 so you literally can't tell from like embedding it in the project which one you're using you'd have to you know ask it what, what your version is and it'll tell you i'm lua jit instead and it's incredibly fast which is nice for Things you want to run on every keystroke or every time text changes <laughs> yeah, or ever, yeah. right? You would be like, oh, it's 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 really nice to have that speed uh, running over and over inside inside your editor. So sort of all of those together bring it to a place where it's really powerful and easy to embed. And then like as an overall summary, the language is small and that's good, I think, for a scripting language inside an editor. We don't want it to be like you have to get a bachelor's degree in NeoVim <laughs> to like start configuring, right? Like it feels that way sometimes, say, for like writing a JetBrains plugin. Like I've written a JetBrains plugin. JetBrains are awesome IDEs, but it's really you don't just casually stumble into <laughs> writing a JetBrains plugin. Like, oh, something's <laughs> kind of bothering me. I'm gonna just whip up this whole extra IDE experience. I'm gonna write a few random Java classes, and I'm gonna come out on the other side with the experience. It's it's not yeah, it's yeah. not like that, right? You have this whole world of things you have to work on and understand, and the space of people using NeoVim is huge, you know, all the way, oh, I'm doing hardware, or I'm doing embedded, or I'm doing firmware, or I'm doing software, or I'm doing front end, I'm doing, right? So you have this huge space. So you want to pick a language that like is the quickest for anybody to be able to pick up in a lot of ways, right? And, and yeah, Lua is definitely that. in my mind that, you know, you want to store data, you've got a table. That's it. Doesn't matter how you want to store it, you've got tables, yeah, right? One one data structure to rule them all, right? Right, exactly yeah. right. And so so Lua has this idea. It's it's called um, mechanisms over policies. And so this this sort of idea that we it gives you the features that you need to build something like an object oriented system inside Lua, but it's not going to say here's five keywords that you need to learn to make those. Right? It's it's all built off of the same. Same idea. So you master those base mechanisms and then you can do anything you want in Lua instead of like, oh, I have to go memorize the 100 plus keywords to be able to do those things. Not that there's anything wrong with languages that do that. I, I like plenty of languages that do that. But it is very different to sort of force people into that to just get started with configuring an editor that's yeah. primary. one of its primary features is configurability right you're like you you need to get there somehow and, and lua is a really nice stepping stone to do that yeah yeah i think it's it's like targeting the the habits and the needs of the audience i found that anytime i'm configuring my editor it's probably something i'm just that's bugging me and i fix up in a lunchtime yep mm -hmm. so something lightweight that you can just jump in and write a few lines of without thinking too much right yes and lua yeah. is really great at that and it also scales reasonably well to writing larger things with some improvements people have been making in the ecosystem with some something like if you're familiar with js doc you know the sort of style of writing javascript types in a comment above the function oh, nice. and like um yeah so it's it's like in some ways kind of an alternative typescript but it's not it's not in the code right you write some comments and then the lsp will like parse those and say oh i can tell that this type or these types don't actually match if you said so have a similar okay. thing in lua where you can you know write the types of certain functions and and all this kind of stuff right and and the tooling around that is getting really surprisingly good for for Lua. And so you can still get some of this thing where it says, hey, you said you were supposed to pass three arguments, but you only passed two, right? Even though Lua like allows you to do that and all this other stuff, right? It's sort of like opting in, which is nice for people writing plugins or larger things inside. But then you can kind of skip those if you're just writing a random <laughs> thing for yourself to fix the problem during lunchtime. So it scales pretty nicely um, with some of the, the tooling that's coming out, which is great as well. Yeah, yeah. A lot of like plug-in editor things or configuration things, they're short. And I, I often think there's not much to choose between languages below about a thousand lines. Mm -hmm. Pick the one you like the most. Yeah. When it, it's when it gets large that the different language features really project themselves out. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe we should talk about how you've used Lua in Anger to configure <laughs> Vim because you've, um, you've written a few important plugins. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've done a few. I, I've written a lot of Lua. <laughs> um, <laughs> and 
I, I, I hesitate to admit it in public. I've written a lot of Vim script. Okay, I'll just put it out there. <laughs> Maybe that makes the rest of this podcast. You know, pe- people are all done listening to my opinions. <laughs> I mean, I just want to know how badly you sinned in a former life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I've written many thousands of lines of Vim script. So mm. not just not just like, oh, he wrote, you know, some config. I, I wrote a lot of stuff. Jeez. In fact, I even wrote on our progression of getting LSP into NeoVim, I wrote an LSP client in VimScript in sort of in in hopes of, you oh know, maybe one God. day getting that put inside of Vim and some other things. We eventually wrote that in Lua, partially <laughs> performance, partially we we just wanted to be able to iterate and make it like our own design and stuff and not have to worry about trying to, to get those mixed uh, together and everything. But so that was one project, I guess, eventually that I wrote in a lot of in Lua. Uh, there were a couple other key contributors as well who really pushed the NeoVim LSP project forward. But I've written a lot of stuff for um, LSP inside of NeoVim. The the other one that a lot of people will know if they use NeoVim is a project called Telescope. Telescope is a fuzzy finder for NeoVim, and it's built like for NeoVim. Kind of, it started off as just an experiment between, I would say, trying to push the barriers of Lua integration inside NeoVim. I was much earlier in NeoVim's life cycle, and I wanted to sort of see where are our edge cases that we're running up against where Lua support feels, oh, that's really hard to do, uh, and, and it yeah, shouldn't yeah. be, right? Yeah. And so I was trying to push some of those boundaries as well as explore, like, can we write something that is really fast in Lua, right? How fast can it really be? Can it sort? A hundred items every keystroke. Can it stroke? A th- can it do a thousand? Can it do ten thousand? Right, and sort of explore some of those boundaries. And also, I was interested to see if we could provide an experience kind of like FCF, which I love and think is amazing. FCF uh, is a, a fuzzy finder that people used inside NeoVim and also like from the terminal and some other places that searches. Okay. It's written in Go, really fast, really awesome project. Um, I want to see could I build a project that's like that. But it like is inside NeoVim in a like built in kind of fashion, right? In the sense right. that like, oh, it reuses your color scheme. Can you make it so that it's all your colors, right? It doesn't look different because you're running it from the command line and piping it in. Does it does it use your colors? Can you make it so that it knows about every NeoVim feature, right? It knows what key maps you have, the commands, auto commands, color schemes, you know, highlights, anything, you know, can, can we make it do all of these things? Um, and so it was kind of just an experiment there but that ended up being, um, very large and, and pretty successful, it's way <laughs> more successful than I had imagined starting it on my Twitch stream and playing around with the idea that people were going <laughs> to really want to <laughs> use it. Um, and so that's one, and then maybe like the goofiest Lua project, um, that I worked on. The project isn't really written in Lua. It's written in uh, Rust, actually. But you, there's a lot of Lua going on inside the project, which is a Vim 9 script to Lua transpiler. So it takes in Vim 9 script, which we can talk about a little bit if you want, and turns that into Lua that can execute inside of NeoVim, which was also quite a fun project. Uh, Hang on, I think we need to back up a little bit there. So yeah. Vim 9 script is not Vim script. That's correct. So um, Vim 8 was the Vim 8 dot something was the Vim version that pe- most people have probably used if they've been using Vim any time in the last, say, 15 or 20 years, I think. Maybe it's not quite that long, but Vim 8 has been around for a long time. I probably misspoke and someone's going to say it hasn't been that long, but it felt like that for me. It was Vim 8 for <laughs> like as long as I can remember, basically. Right. I think Vim forked at about, or Neo Vim forked at about 7.4. Okay, so maybe 8 is like 10 years old or something like that. Okay. Um, and so one of the things that the community was asking for in, on the Vim side was we'd really like to be able to write plugins that go faster, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. um, if you don't know, VimScript is a literal line-by-line interpreted like language. So if you have a for loop and you have 10 lines inside the for loop, it will read the first line, read the 10 lines inside, go back and reparse eval and run each line line. So it's like, you know, if you have a tight loop of something, you have a lot of extra overhead that you don't need, but it's there because of the way that VimScript evolved um, from just X commands into a programming language. So there's yeah. lots of sort of good historical reasons for that. So, so Bram said, okay, like, 
let's see what he said. Let's see what I can do um, to make that happen. And so he made sort of an upgraded version of VimScript called Vim9 script. That is like, um, you like in some ways it's backwards compat in the sense that like you still can do Vim script things inside of Vim nine script. There's no like deleting the old Vim script, right? right. It's like still there. Um, but it's like, a, there's all these new language features on top and effectively there's like a, a part of the language now that's like typed. It gets compiled into byte code. The byte code gets run. Like it does all this extra stuff. Right. And <laughs> And it, and it's like definitely better than Vim script. Like he made a lot of <laughs> d- decisions that are much better <laughs> than than original Vim script, right? Um, okay. Which is nice. You know, he got a chance to to revisit some of those. So that's that's cool. But NeoVim wasn't ready. It just isn't able, basically, to like port all of those changes, maintain all of those, keep all of that working inside of NeoVim. So we were kind of at like this impasse. Right, of saying like, okay, we have this new thing that's going on in Vim, Vim nine script. It's like an upgraded version of Vim script, right? We want to be able to still share things like the runtime files. And when I say runtime files, I mean like, oh, you load a C file, and it's going to run some code to set up Vim or NeoVim for C. We like share those as much as possible with Vim. We send upstream patches when we know something, when we see something is missing. We pull their patches and update our code. Okay. Okay, but if they start using Vim nine script we like lose that right and that's like that's sad we don't want to do that we like we like vim we we love vim you know like we want to work with them we want to make sure like both are the best editors they can be how can we make that happen so kind of did like an exploratory project that turned out to actually work surprisingly well um and there's a couple files like right now if you're using neovim you're using a couple files that have been transpiled from vim 9 script into lua and they're like (laughs) shipped by default inside of neovim and no one's reported any issues that i know of so they must be working (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah that's that's good enough for a qa report yeah yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) so you actually sat down and wrote rust vim 9 script to lua compiler Yes. Yep. I, I certainly did. Yep. <laughs> How did that go? Um, so it was it was kind of funny because I had tried uh, before a, a few times. I I tried kind of a few iterations of the project where I had written some of it in in Lua before, but it ended up just getting too unwieldy. Like the project was really big. It was really I, I Lua is a great language, but I wouldn't want to write like a compiler in it, right? Like you, you don't have exhaustive matching. You don't have, you know, you like want yeah, to be yeah. able to like make a sum type and have exhaustive matching on the sum types and pattern match out and do, and like, okay, well, you've picked the wrong language then. It's like, okay, we don't need that <laughs> yes. for Lua. We, we just don't, there's, there's different options you can do that are better. So eventually I landed on trying it out um, in Rust and it, 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 it works so like, it's just like how you would do any other language, right? In the sense that like, okay, I write a lexer. Like, okay, the lexer is a little bit more complicated than some other languages because we have to handle some weirdness around detecting Vim9 script versus Vim script, blah, 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 stuff like this, right? Okay. And then, okay, so now we've got our lexer. Now we just write our parser. Okay, our parser is going to start putting these into Vim constructs. You know, oh, I see the auto command keyword. I know what's coming next. We've got to parse auto commands, right? So we turn... That stream of tokens into an auto command structure. Oh, I see that now we're in a function call. Okay, we're going to put it. This is, you know, same thing you would do for any other language. And then, yeah. okay, sure. So now we need to get to our like compile step basically, right? But instead of like targeting LLVM, we we target writing Lua code, <laughs> you know? And like, <laughs> yeah. and so the output instead of being like byte code is a big string that we <laughs> save to a Lua file. And... There you go. So in some ways, you know, that part's easier, right? Because you can you can write some, you know, Lua helper functions and do some stuff and load those in as libraries. And you can, you know, just like pull oh, those yeah. in and do, you know, like runtime analysis of stuff like, oh, I actually don't know what function I need to call if this is a string versus if it's a dictionary. Okay, well, right. we can just check the type, you know, and we, and we can do that. Um, so, so there's some parts about that are way simpler than if you were trying to like, Actually, I would say like basically everything about it is simpler than trying to target something like LLVM, right? You're like, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. way, it's way harder. And the yeah. other kind of fun part about it, right, is like since you're outputting to Lua, I can just read the code and see if it looks good or not, right? Yeah, Which is kind of yeah, funny yeah. as opposed to like 
Hmm, okay, so I see zero X zero seven three seven two 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 one. Oh man! I don't <laughs> yeah. have to, you know, you're like you're t- like you know that that yeah. seems actually in some ways you know harder than if your if your output um, is Lua code. And then yeah. the the sort of side thing with that is like I don't actually have to do the entire language and every like possibly cursed thing you could think of to do <laughs> right. Like it, <laughs> our goal for the project was. Can we take the like normative things that get inside of Vim's repo and can we turn those into reasonable Lua? And like, they're great developers, they're smart software developers. They're not just going to like let someone merge in something absolutely insane that's like abusing all of the features of Vim 9 script, right? So I can sort of like hand wave away some things and say, well, I know technically. You could, I don't know, construct a function by concatenating two strings and executing and evaling those. And you know, okay, yeah, yeah. cool. They're not going to do that, so I'm safe. You know, <laughs> like, and so yeah. there's some aspects where, you know, at least up until now, I, you know, I've been able to sort of hand wave away those problems. Say we don't have to worry about that. Our primary focus and like the constraint that we have is we want to be able to keep sharing code between vim and neo vim where we can um and and like how can we solve that and that turned out to be at least for now and for some files like a viable way to do that (laughs) yeah yeah i can see how that's a much more tractable problem than it first seems because you're you're dealing with us not the whole source language but a sensible subset of it Mm -hmm. You've got control over whether it suddenly goes wrong. You don't have to yes. immediately be able to support every feature that's out there. And, I, you know, I often think that the dividing line between what's a compiler and what's a transpiler is, would you like to write the output language? Hmm. That's a good, it's a good definition. Yeah. 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 And Lua is fun to write. So it's like, uh, then in that sense, it would definitely be a transpiler. And the other <laughs> thing that's sort of like, interesting about it is for some features that are exactly the same between vim script and vim 9 script i don't have to do any transpiling i just tell Uh neo vim run the vim script code which is sort of another funny thing right i have already this vim script evaluator in neo (laughs) vim yeah right so there's some aspects too where we got to do even easier hand waving of being like oh i see a syntax uh command okay well, those are the same. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> just tell Neo Vim to evaluate it and move on. You know, it was like, got to got to wipe my hands clean and move on <laughs> yeah, yeah. from handling those, which was uh, another sort of funny, funny aspect of it. And it was a, it's a fun project. Like it's, it's pretty fun to try and basically write your own language. You know, I didn't get to control the syntax, but everything besides that, I sort of get to control and, you know, some of the things, but like it actually is getting used by someone, you know, like it's always been something I'd like to do is write a language, but I'm like, who's going to use my language, you know, but this (laughs) one people are using it's, you know, it's shipped to at least, you know, dozens and dozens of people's computers. Yeah. Yeah, I've never thought of that as a selling point for writing transpilers, but they will, it will be, won't it? Yeah, totally. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So we're getting into this because on the surface, that sounds like a very niche, unique situation for you to face, compiling Mm -hmm. Vim 9 scripts to a language (laughs) that already supports a subset of it. Yes. But there's a much bigger issue here at play, which is weird languages and maintaining and forking. And I'm wondering, looking at Vim as a 30-year-old project Mm -hmm. and forking it in a way that works and brings some new life to the project and is successful is there anything we can learn in general about (laughs) like bringing life to long-standing legacy projects yeah i mean one thing that's nice is like vim it still has a lot of life in it so it's like it's it's good to you know be forking a project that is currently (laughs) successful and people enjoy and use so that's like a nice starting point and definitely not to be uh, underestimated in a lot of Neo Vim's yeah. success. I, I don't right? want to say anything yeah. no, no. against Vim, but no, yeah. definitely that's. I, yeah, I was more saying like that's a helpful starting point if you want to have a successful project. <laughs> finding a, the project that people already like is a good starting place. <laughs> um, and then I think uh, a really important to this is you really need to sort of decide what are what makes you different, you know, from a project either that you're forking or that you're doing? And can you sort of constrain your vision 
to to a targetable and achievable goal? And can you make sure that that goal doesn't like expand for no reason and that all the things that you're doing, both like process and technical decision, projects you decide to do, projects you don't decide to do, that they're in service of that. But then also you need to, I think, really important thing is communicate what those are so that the people who are coming to your project aren't surprised, right? When they, when they, you know, why doesn't any of them have X? Well, if X clearly contradicts the stated goals of NeoVim, right, of being like this hyper extensible modern editor leveraging, you know, technologies that are useful in the world around us, right? If if that X doesn't make sense, then, okay, th- then that's clear. We can just say no and we can sort of say we're not going to do that because it doesn't, it doesn't match up. Uh, and that's really powerful. And I think that vision shared both between the people working on the project, but also the people using and contributing in the community is really, really important for for the success of like an open source project. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. But then again, I mean, I'm going to push you on this because yeah. I can, yeah, yeah. I'm can. i thinking of like bank projects, right? That's the classic where you've got 30-year-old software. Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely works today for a, for a given value of works. Yes. Everyone wants. And you get two projects that come out of that. One of them says, we're going to, we're going to redo this in a mm-hmm. way that adds in all these new features we wanted for years. Mm-hmm. And that fails because of scope creep. The other one says, oh, no, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is sure, we're going to rework the existing infrastructure. And that sort of gets there, but it sort of turns into a navel-gazing project that never actually launches anything yeah. that's different from what's already there. Yep. How yeah, do so you I avoid think, going into those two pits? Yeah, despair? that's a really good question. So I think NeoVim has been able to avoid that, um, I would say a huge reason is NeoVim has a lot of tests, a lot of unit tests, which is good for small units of code where we can verify that the behavior that, you know, before we refactored it is the same as Vim's, which is really helpful. Okay. But also we have a lot of, I think, really impressive, like functional tests, you know, sort of end to end is weird to call them like integration tests because it's not integrating yeah. anything. It's just NeoVim, but like functional tests are usually what we call them where we can run and do stuff and control NeoVim and we can like assert stuff about what the screen looks like afterwards. So you run it oh, okay. on like, you know, an 80 by 24 screen, right? Or whatever. And then you can literally like write out what the screen looks like and say the cursor <laughs> should be here. The highlight yeah. should look like this. And right? because and you're so, screenshotting it as a, but not as an image, as actual yeah, it's just text, right? Text, so right? They're, right? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're just columns and character, you know, columns and rows with characters in them with, you know, attributes associated with them. So you can yeah, literally yeah. like, literally write this, oh, it should be in this mode. It should be showing this mode, right? You know, all this sort of thing. And the yeah. testing for that is really, really good, really, really powerful. And like a key thing that Neovim does for a lot of stuff. So particularly for, you know, the second kind of project you said, we were saying, oh, well, we actually can't rewrite this. No one can effectively like rewrite it. What you're going to do is you're accidentally going to miss the reasons why a bunch of this, we'll say cruft exists, right? You're like, oh, this, this if statement must never happen. Why would this even be here? Why is this 80 lines of code even here? And then two years later, you get the bug, you add the same if statement back in. Yeah, and then you find like, out the hard oh. way. Right, and now it's not designed to be able to handle the if statement that way. So now it's three times as much code and you broke your perfect abstraction, right? Which is fine if you don't need to replicate any behavior maybe, right? But if you're trying to be a proper fork, which NeoVim is, right? In the sense that like, if you open up Vim and you open up NeoVim, you really can't tell the difference out of the box, right? And But all the simple things you do in Vim will be the same as NeoVim. You need you you need some way to do that and make that easy. And there was so much work, especially done at the beginning of the project, to just build out this whole testing infrastructure, build these tests, asserting the behavior. You write the test before, you're making sure that it's going to be able to do the same thing as Vim does, except for when we're like calling out that we want to change a behavior. Oh, we're going to change this default because we think this default's better or something, right? You know, then it's like, okay, well, then the test change and we can confirm that like the defaults change. That's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so so there's sort of like there's a lot of things like that. But I think for us, for the kind of project that NeoVim is, this sort of end to end functional test, which like if I was in charge of redoing some bank software, oh man, the first I don't know how long <laughs> would be we got to figure out what the behavior is <laughs> before, yeah. we, before we try and replicate it or change it. Right. Because a lot of the times it's not clear. Um, and I think people sometimes have a 
like a predisposition to say, well, I can just read it and I can know what the behavior is and then I can just write the better version. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. well, I'm not good enough as a developer to do that. I need to write something <laughs> down to, to confirm what it is. And then the other problem is you kind of want to be able to keep that behavior. So even if you do it on the first try, you got it right. It'd still be good if in a year you could still count on your bank handling, you know, case X, Y, Z correctly and your money not disappearing. Right. Like, <laughs> <Yeah. you know? laughs> So I think, I don't know that that's honestly probably one of the things that I think, you know, you can go and look and the just got folder after folder of all of these tests and all these different platforms and everything. Right. Because we want to make sure we're not, you know, degrading any of those things. And then after yeah. you do that, it really sets you free to write a big refactor of stuff, right? Like when I, 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 I don't remember a year or a year and a half ago, I rewrote a lot of the auto commands code um, in the oven, which is kind of like event listeners, event listeners if for those people who don't yeah, are so familiar with. On, on file open hook, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yep. So I rewrote a lot of that code to let you pass Lua, um, like Lua refs deep into that stack. So you could just pass Lua functions directly into, into that like sort of area, right? And as I was doing that, I just took every test that Vim had, if we hadn't poured them all yet for auto commands, and every test we had for auto commands, and I ran it every time I saved, <laughs> <laughs> I saved my files. And if something broke as I was changing stuff, then I realized, okay, I've broken behavior for auto commands. We need to fix this. Or if I stumbled onto behavior that I thought, hmm, it really looks like if you run three separate auto commands in a row, they run like they're right after each other. You know, so you're like, okay, so it looks like that's the case. I don't know. Vim and Neo Vim have been around for a long time. Someone's probably depending on that behavior, right? Even if it's <laughs> yeah. even if it's not documented, even if we're not like making a promise about that. If I can make it so that it doesn't break that, that's really good. And so, you know, iterating on that, adding lots and lots of tests, adding lots and lots of ideas. Um, and the nice thing for the NeoVim tests, we make them run really fast. I think that's another sort of core requirement is if you yeah. can make them run fast, then people will run them. And if they run slow, people won't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I would do. You know, if I'm, if I'm trying to revitalize some legacy project, you know, at work or whatever, I'm going to be starting with building out this fast test suite that's going to be telling me, am I able to make the same make the same behavior because that's really yeah. important yeah because the, the danger is with big rewrites is that you think you know what you're getting into whereas writing down a lot of tests says you know ex precisely what you're aiming for mm -hmm. yeah and i, I don't know if you've ever times. if you've ever experienced this where you see a chunk of code and then you're thinking oh it's so ugly well first off i usually wrote it right so you're like <laughs> oh it's so ugly. <laughs> but, but besides that case right besides that case um you know, you, you look at it and think, oh, it's so ugly. Like, I can definitely rewrite this and make it better. Like, I'm smarter now or we know more now. Mm -hmm. And then you like, you know, you spend a few days hacking or whatever on it. You're writing it. And then you get done and it's the same exact code that you had before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that can happen. <laughs> and so, you know, rewrites tend to suffer from this problem. There's so many places along the way, whether it's forgetting some behavior or not solving the original problems or um, adding some new behavior or some adding pathologically bad case that you didn't know and yours ends up slow. And there's like all these things that without measuring and without actually, you know, like putting the science in computer science, I guess, you know, you could say like, you're, you're just sort of going off of your gut. And like, sometimes that works good. Uh, I mean, some people are really good at this, and they're just able to sit down. Uh, like, I don't have this. Uh, I don't have that gift. That's okay. You know, I like to write the tests, I like to make sure I'm doing what I want. And then, and then I can iterate on it, just like I would iterate on, you know, any other project. And I find, like, fast iteration tends to beat like full rewrites right and that like that's been yeah, my experience yeah, in yeah. neovim is that we're able to iterate really quickly on a lot of these features with confidence because we we have good you know test i don't like saying test coverage because it makes it sound like we're counting lines we're not doing like line you know but like test coverage of feature in the feature sense and it makes you feel really confident that like yep I got green on CI. I didn't mess anything up. Sweet. Let's merge it and we'll we'll keep moving. And that's really, yeah. really powerful to like push a project forward and allow people to explore and try new ideas. Even if you scrap a PR and you're like, that wasn't the right way. I've had a few PRs where I've scrapped them, you know, for Neovim or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. It's still like, oh, I was able to find out it was a bad idea instead of like living with the regret of never shipping that feature. You're like, it was actually a bad feature. <laughs> You know, it was, yeah. I was wrong. That's okay. Live Moving learn. on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this raises the question then of all the 
obvious possible choices. What are the what's the test suite written in that works? Oh, it's so Lua. Fast? Yeah, it's Lua. I was wondering. Yeah, that was actually one of the ways that Lua started. Because like even before Lua was like properly the scripting language, we had a lot of like tooling and some other things built around NeoVim that was using Lua. And like the nice yeah. thing is you can really easily hook into the FFI and all this other stuff, right? So you can like load out constants from Vim, or you can call functions, or you can, you know, you can like do stuff at that sort of ABI level in that like C level that like is very difficult sometimes to do otherwise or requires a lot of maintenance. Oh, we've got, you know, 10,000 constants over here. We need to make sure they're all the same between these two languages. Oof. (laughs) <laughs> painful right <laughs> yeah um and we even I, I don't actually know exactly when this started i'd have to go check some of the history because I, I wasn't involved with this part but we were even you know doing some simple things where we would generate some c code from lua so that we could have like some introspection into something like generating docs based on like a lua table and then you would generate some like very simple c file right with with those things as comments right but then you get those you can like put those into the documentation. You can like save those off somewhere and do other things like that. So it's like right. Lua was kind of used in some of the build and testing stuff before it was even sort of like the official scripting uh, language of NeoVim, which is really powerful. Right. So if I want to do this at the bank, I need a lightweight scripting language that's really fast that has good FFI with COBOL. Yeah, which would probably be Lua because I'm sure COBOL has like good FFI with C. And so then you're already done, basically. Okay, you know, you just cool. like you just can pretend probably in the middle or something like that. Yeah. Um, so Bro, you want to talk about NeoVim, but you're also yeah. proving to be an ambassador for Lua too. Yeah, I am. I am a huge I am a huge fan of Lua. Um, I think it's a really elegant and beautiful language that composes lots of little small things together, you know, and makes it, in, it makes you able to build big things, which I think is just super cool. Um, yeah. So yes, huge fan. <laughs> so I, I'm going to ask you, this is a bit of a wild card, but one of the yeah. things, so uh, I used Vim, um, the original one, uh, yep. for like 10 years, got dis, got uh, disillusioned by Vim script and switched to using Emacs. Mm-hmm in vim mode because it has a really good vim emulator yep. right one thing i think emacs does really well as an editor that you want to tweak is you can do kind of interactive writing of code so you can write some code and evaluate it and it's already running in the editor mm-hmm. what's the support for writing lua in neo vim to change neo vim as you're writing it yeah it's actually i think really good um so lua has this concept of sort of like packages or modules they're just files basically right and like files are just a big chunk of lua code they're like calling a function right and so you can actually just tell lua hey reload this file and it will just do it and in in the current execution state right um or you can just re-execute the current file that you're in if that's all you're doing right but if you want to sort of like update all the references you would need to tell lua please reload the file like properly, right? And you can do that interactively. And that's how I develop most of my NeoVim like plugins that I write is I just reload it live as I'm going. I resource either to the file or tell it to reload, you know, like five files or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, and it'll just it'll just do that. And besides for a few sort of like edge cases. I mean, if you want to test, like, does it work when NeoVim starts up? You, you kind of yeah, got to like, fair. you know, you kind of got to go do, <laughs> you got to go restart it, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's nice because usually like my NeoVim starts in like 50 milliseconds or something. So it's not like it's a super pain to close and <laughs> close and run it again. But um, but I think that the support for that in Lua is really good. It's very interactive. There's no sort of like state that you can't reset, um, especially if you're sort of setting up your your plugins or your in, your things to be done like this. You know, maybe if you're doing like a million globals and you're like doing this complicated web of like references, you'll have a really hard time solving that. But if it's sort of like, I just want to reload, easy peasy, no problem at all. Re- really easy cool. to do in Lua. Cool. Then... I mean, because you're coming across as a power editor user, obviously, you've fallen <laughs> yeah. down that rabbit hole. Yes. <laughs> I'm just thinking, if we're talking about customizing your editor, we should probably talk about why you'd want to. If someone's there using, I don't want to pick on a particular editor, but the yep. editors that you wouldn't do any more than mm-hmm. set preferences on, yep. what are they missing out that you as a power editor hacker feel you have? 
So, so this is like a common question I get, you know, like I stream on Twitch and I'm doing other stuff like that. And so people are like, convince me why I should use NeoVim. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And, and so my answer always is no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, that's not my point. Fair enough. You know, that's, that's, that's not what I'm, I'm yeah, trying yeah. to do. And I think, so one of the ideas sort of that I've been working on and trying to sort of think about is, is why do I like NeoVim? You know, like, yeah. I mean, obviously I like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that much why? is clear. Uh, and other people like it too, right? It's one thing for just me to like it, but like lots of other people uh, seem to like it. So, and the concept sort of that I, I have coined, I guess, with this is the idea of like, instead of an integrated development environment, like an IDE, right, we have this personalized development environment, a PDE. And okay. the, the, there's, there's sort of like a few, I would say, characteristics that define whether something is IDE versus PDE. And like, one of them would be that the average user configures the editor by writing a programming language, right? So they, they have to like write code to configure the editor, right? Yep. Um, and that's sort of like, in a sense, sort of the key uh, defining characteristic of, of what makes a what makes a PDE. Um, and, and, and the average user is an important part because there's tons of people writing plugins for VS Code and JetBrains. Yep. But the average user doesn't even know that that's like possible. They just know that there's like a storefront. And I don't know, they probably think like, <laughs> they're just from Microsoft or something, right? You know what I mean? Which is totally fine. Um, and so... Yeah. So my thought with this is that there are certain like personalities effectively that are interested or like attracted to this idea. And it has no, you know, it's like it's orthogonal to whether they're a good developer or not. Uh, it's just completely orthogonal to this. I think yeah. curiosity in general probably correlates with how good of a or like how effective of a software developer you are. But it does not have to be curiosity in the realm of your text editor. <laughs> like, yeah. You can have you can be super curious about network protocols or like how does the browser repaint things or like what's the yeah. best way to make this thing look good with CSS. And you're There's like no really of things to be interested in. right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So I think curiosity probably correlates with um, like effectiveness, but I don't think curiosity of your text editor, right? That's like an additional <laughs> add on that yeah. comes in. Um, but a lot of people, I think, do enjoy this idea of being curious and interested and tinkering with the tools that they're using every day. And then in, in addition to that, I generally find that people really like, and this is this for me as well, they really like removing those small annoyances that like are only possible when you can make it yours. There's no mm. possible way for me, the maintainer of NeoVim, to predict every way people are going to want to use NeoVim. I I'm yeah. constantly surprised. I'm constantly surprised how I use NeoVim. I'm like, <laughs> I didn't think I was going to do that. And then I do it, right? Um, yeah. So if I can't predict my own thing, I definitely can't predict <laughs> everybody else's. But if I can make a system that allows people to customize and personalize it to themselves, then they can find the way to make that their own, right? And I think that doesn't appeal to everybody. Some people are like, oh, the reason I code is because I want to ship this product. Mm. Then you're probably like really bored with thinking about your editor and you don't even really care, right? Or, oh, the reason I write code is because I really like, you know, whatever it is, collaborating with other people and solving big problems. Then you also probably are like, can I get this editor out of my way? I want to do the other thing, right? Mm, yeah. But but like some things, they just probably irrationally, probably too much, they just bother me. You know, like, oh, I had to click three <laughs> times. And I'm like, Ugh! <laughs> oh my goodness, my day's ruined. I had three <laughs> clicks today. You know, like, oh, I can't believe I have to do that every time I want to submit something. Um, you know, and then, and so I'm like, well, why not just write a function for that? Why, why can't I just do that? And then that's what NeoVim lets me do. So that's that idea yeah. of like the personalized aspect plus code. I think it really appeals to some people. And I think um, a lot of people much, you know, much smarter and better at this uh, than I am in the NeoVim project have helped sort of maintain that ability to have a system that follows this sort of Lua idea of like mechanisms over policies, right? And since we give you the tools that you need to construct the stuff that you want to do, we're not going to like prescribe these are the 
50,000 different like keywords you need to know or special classes you need to know or, you know, whatever it is, just like, you don't have to do those things. You can just like write Lewis. So so that's sort of, that's at least my current like hypothesis or theory about what's going on, why I enjoy it and why other people do. And also why for some people it just looks like the biggest and lamest waste of time, you know, you could (laughs) imagine, right? Which I, I totally, I totally get. Although I will say I do think I've become a much better developer by using NeoVim, not because I use NeoVim, but because I've been able to be my own customer and I've been able to iterate on that. And like the feedback loop for me being my own customer and making my own thing is as fast as I could write the code. The feedback loop for me iterating on a design and getting it shipped to customers at like a day job you know, at, at my first place that I worked was a large medical health records company. So the, my feedback loop for that was like a year and a half. That's yeah. when I'd find out what customers thought about the feature I made, right? Yeah. Well, it's like, okay, it's really hard to iterate on API design, on taste, on, you know, performance, on, on style, on all these things, right? When I don't hear anything back for a year and a half. And yeah, then if I impossible. fix something, I don't hear anything back for six months, right? As opposed to like, I'm doing something in NeoVim. I didn't like it. Okay, let's fix it. And then it's like, boom, 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 boom. Right, and so you get to like move, you get to try a lot of things. And so I think it is possible to take some of the struggles that people normally sort of associate with wasting all of your time inside of NeoVim and turn those into sort of like effective learning opportunities for debugging or reading code or collaborating or contributing to other projects, right? All these sorts of things. Oh, well, I can do those inside NeoVim. And NeoVim is sometimes just like a vehicle for doing those things. And I think it's an effective one. So it is kind of fun. I think people sometimes look past that. Um, But I wouldn't do any of them if I didn't think it was fun. So I get why they think it's (laughs) stupid. You know, like I get both sides. I'm with them. You know, I get it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There's also the aspect there of like when making it possible, right? You couldn't, if you're working at a healthcare provider where the ter- feedback loop is a year and a half, mm-hmm. you can't suddenly decide you want to customize the software, right? <laughs> yes. And it's the same with editors. If you make the bar to just tweaking this little thing very, mm-hmm. very low and very, yep. very easy, you might find that your users actually are those personality types and they didn't know. Yes. I think there's probably like some doctors that wish they had the NeoVim of healthcare records. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, you know, they probably wish that they had that instead of sort of getting a top down, you know, top down mandate for some of those things or whatever. And so, yeah, well, there's that's definitely also one of the aspects of like a PDE that sort of I think. The important bit is your configuration is the code. It's the same code that you use to write plugins and do larger larger modifications later, right? It's like I write Lua to configure something small. Then I do a little bit more Lua and I have something big. And then eventually I just like accidentally wrote a plugin. And you're like, (laughs) oh, I could like share this with somebody and it like might be useful to them, right? And so there's this really cool aspect, I think, as opposed to um, the way you configure like VS code is usually through like the settings bar or some JSON file. That's not how you write functionality, right? So there's a disconnect yeah. from, there's not a good on-ramp from zero to plugin as opposed to like for a PDE, which I made up so I get to choose how it's fine. There's that <laughs> on-ramp is like, it's there, right? So you have the same on-ramp all the way along and those that language and the way you do it is all the same. Yeah, yeah, there's not this sudden wall where you switch from the configuration language to the right. programming language. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I'm prepared to let that uh, that barrier disappear in my next banking project. <laughs> yes, for banking, <laughs> we probably Maybe want to configure it. Yeah, but... the wall's really good, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if somebody wanted to... Um, if somebody wanted to take the plunge and see if maybe they got the tweaking the editor bug... <laughs> I know you have a good place to start, so tell me about this. Yeah, so there's a project um, that was, you know, sort of started and kicked off initially by some other people in the community, but over the last year or two, I've um, sort of taken taken on more of a role in called Kickstart and Vim, um, and the the goal of that project is very different from say like a NeoVim distribution. Not that there's anything wrong with those, but different constraints, right? Just like we had talked about before. Yeah. And the goal of of Kickstart is like, okay, it's pretty daunting 
to go from the editor that you see when you open up NeoVim with no configuration, <laughs> right, to something that you feel like, oh, I could see myself being productive in this, right? That's a big, there's a big gap there. And yeah, you kind of have to make a few choices up front, which can yep. seem too much. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if you get unlucky and you stumble onto an article from a year and a half ago and you didn't recognize it, then you're going to like set it up in some way and then hear someone else talking about it and everyone's doing something different now or whatever. And you're like, oh, my whole thing's ruined, even though you probably still gained a lot of valuable information in round two should be easier, but regardless of that, right? So the idea is kind of like Kickstart is this is this project that primarily is just this one file. We have a few other files in the project to sort of show next steps, how you could do other things, but they're ancillary. They don't actually matter. You, you don't need those. You could just literally copy the init Lua file and paste it into the right spot on your computer and it will work just fine. So is this one file and it, the goal of that file is to start from zero and tell you either a few places you need to go read, like if you've never opened Vim or NeoVim before, you need to go do Vim Tutor so that you can like learn that the arrow keys aren't the best way to move around and how to exit the <laughs> yeah. editor, right? You're yeah. like, okay. So like those two things you kind of like need to, you need to get, right? And like a few tips of where you can learn about Lua. But, but after that, it shows you all the basics from setting options, like how do I set options? How do I change basic configurations? How do I start doing key maps? How do I start doing auto commands, right? How do I make that? So it's like, Key maps are like, how do I make the do the editor do something when I do something, right? Mm. Then auto commands is like, how do I make the editor do something when it does something? Oh, that's a nice way to right? look at it. Yeah. Right? And so, so you're like expanding the scope of how you can do it. And then after we've done those and you're sort of introduced to those, we introduce a package manager for, for NeoVim called Lazy. And it um, is just like an easy way to get projects from GitHub, put them in the right spot, get them updated or anywhere. You can download not just from GitHub too. And like get those installed and set up. And we show you the different ways that you can get those projects installed. We install some of them. And then we show you moving from zero configuration for plugins to some of the more advanced ones, the sort of skeleton of how you would set them up, right? And the project is about, last time I checked when I was finished, it might be just over, it was 299 lines of code and about 400 lines of comments. And that's all the setup. So so I wrote a lot of docs. I tried to explain like literally every line, right? So you can start at the top of the file, you read down to the bottom. And when you're finished, you're like, oh, okay. So this isn't as overwhelming as I thought, right? And when you're done, you have, you know, an LSP. So you can do auto completion and go to def and go to references. And you see all the key maps that set that up. So you're not like lost. You're not like, okay, but how do I do anything? It's like, okay, well, you do it by pressing the buttons that you read as you were going through, right? It has yeah. a fuzzy finder for telescope, right? So you can search through files or you can search through your workspace or you can grep for stuff. It has tree sitter set up, which initially is just for like doing highlighting and some indenting and things like that. And it has autocomplete set up. And then it has a few other things, you know, color scheme and a few other sort of small, small aspects going on. And so it's like when you're done, you have effectively this mini like editing environment that you should be be able to understand i'll say all of it right all of the important bits you understand yeah, yeah. after reading reading through the file and you're like oh I, I can i can compose this with other things i know oh i want to switch the color scheme easy i go to the part where i read about color scheme i switch which one all done oh i want to change the key maps for uh to because I don't like pressing G before I G D for go to definition. I don't like G. I want to press control enter or something. Okay, well <laughs> yeah. I just go to the spot. I I changed the spot where it said G D and now it says control enter. Boom. I understand it, right? And I know everything. Yeah. Right. So the idea is that it kickstarts this journey, right? Because it is definitely a lot to start with. Um and and we've been trying to think, you know, how can we solve this problem, you know, in the OVM in general? Because what we don't want to do is sacrifice the extensibility or right? you don't want yeah. to say, Oh, we're going to close off the extensibility and the abilities to make it personalized. But that doesn't mean that we can't do anything to make it simpler to start. Right. And like kickstart is an attempt that I've been sort of doing for a while and ongoing to help make that first step of your journey, right? Like giving you a kickstart on the journey. It's not supposed to be the end goal. I'm not saying I told you everything that you need to know. I'm hoping that I'm giving you the tools to start being able to do that. Um, 
And then I recently released a video uh, about sort of me walking through that and sort of explaining it out loud. Some people, I think, prefer hearing, especially at the beginning, you know, some thoughts about it as opposed to, to reading it. So those are sort of yeah. like goals of how we can do that on ramp. Right. And, and like in in the way that I structured the project itself is an on ramp, right? In the sense that we start with here's the things you know outside of NeoVim, you need to know these, then you need yeah. to know about this about NeoVim, and then here's the simplest thing you can do, a little more advanced, a little more advanced plugins, simple plugins, more advanced plugins, big plugins, right? And so it's sort yeah, of yeah. that same on ramp. So ideally, you're not sort of like bombarded with 80 concepts at once, you can do them one at a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do think there's um like there's a difference in between tools that cater for beginners or occasional users and mm -hmm. tools that cater for people that are going to use this 40 hours a week for the next 10 years. Yes. But that doesn't mean that it has to be a binary choice between these people get a good experience and these people get a sucky experience. Yes, 100%. Yeah, it's nice. I will as as a parting thought, so I thought I should probably let you into this secret. A week ago, I thought, I'll watch your Kickstarter video Ooh. as like prep. It's a half hour mm -hmm. video. I thought, I'll watch that quickly as prep for this uh, podcast. And I still haven't got all the way, all the way through it because every few lines I go like, oh, you can do that. And I go down my own <laughs> little rabbit hole. Yes. Nice. <laughs> so it's, it's more of a meal than it looks. So thank you yes. for that. <laughs> no, that's great. That's That was definitely, we actually had a hilarious time. I recorded that like on my stream. So we were live and I, oh, you know, yeah. was doing multiple takes and I was trying to ask people like, did this land? Like, did everyone get what I was saying here? And so we had to do a lot of takes. So it ended up taking like, you know, I don't remember eight hours or something like that straight <laughs> of just recording to get down to, to the 30 minutes. So I'm really yeah. glad it came across as like feature packed. That is, yes, that's, yeah. you know, I'm like, sweet mission accomplished. <laughs> I think you may have given me more than eight hours of work. So <laughs> I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone else that wants to slip down that rabbit hole. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. And I should probably go and get the next few snippets of wisdom from there now. So <laughs> TJ, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, no problem. I had a great time and hopefully everyone uh, gets to have more fun while they're coding, whatever, <laughs> however, you know, you find fun. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Yeah. Cheers. Uh -huh. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, TJ. If you want to get started with NeoVim, take a look in the show notes for links to that Kickstarter config we talked about and the walkthrough video that TJ made, which is really interesting. If you vehemently disagree with my opinion on VimScript, I will, of course, respect that. But I've put a link in the show notes to VimScript's definition of true and false values. You can agree or disagree with me, but that is the moment it lost my heart. My opinions on VimScript notwithstanding, I'd like to dedicate this episode to Bram Mullinar, the creator of Vim. I think it's such a generous thing he did to spend all those years working on a fantastic tool, and a tool that's been with me in one form or another for most of my career. Bram, thank you and rest in peace. You're a legend. And with that, I think it's just time to say, if you've enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to like, rate, and share it. And make sure you're subscribed, because we'll be back next week with more. For now, I've been your host, Chris Jenkins. This has been Developer Voices with TJ DeVries. Thanks for listening.